on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. And good evening, welcome to First Edition. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. On the programme tonight, Westminster bombshell. Crispin Blunt confirms that he is the Tory MP arrested over a rape allegation as he calls the police move unnecessary. And tech experts accuse Rishi Sunak of giving AI firms a free pass after announcing he won't rush to regulate the industry. Plus, 10.30, a full paper review of tomorrow's newspapers with Thursday night's panel, The Hub Post's Kevin Schofield and pollster Scarlett McGuire. Thanks for joining us. Let's look at the front pages that have come in so far. The sun is in and there is that story. MP in rape and drugs arrest. MP Crispin Blunt revealed himself to be the MP at the centre of that scandal. He, of course, denies all allegations. Uh, the Metro, end of the world is AI. Rishi offered a stark warning to the dangers of artificial intelligence in a speech earlier today. Uh, the FT is also in. It leads with this. Resilient consumer spending spurs US economy to 4.9% GDP growth. The US economy has grown faster than expected in the third quarter. And also, just landed, the I is in. Leads with Tory turmoil as Blunt arrested over rape and drug allegations. That's what's in for now. We'll bring you more of those front pages as soon as we see them. We begin, though, with those developments at Westminster this evening. As Crispin Blunt confirmed, he's the Tory MP arrested over rape allegations. The MP revealed that he's been interviewed twice by cops in a statement online. Mr Blunt said it's been reported that an MP was arrested yesterday in connection with an allegation of rape. I'm confirming that MP was me. He says the arrest was unnecessary and I remain ready to cooperate fully with the investigation that I'm confident will end without charge. Uh, for more on this, let's bring in Thursday night's panel alongside me are the HuffPost UK political editor, Kevin Schofield, and director of the polling company, JL Partners, Scarlett McGuire. Um, welcome to you both. Um, Kevin, is this a, a, a kind of preemptive move? Obviously, we can't talk too much about mm. the full details for legal reasons, but uh, I guess this was one of those stories that you'd spend four days, as we've seen before, everybody guessing the name. Yeah. Who is it going to be? And Mr Blunt has kind of outed himself, saying, I'm, I'm the person at the centre of this investigation. Yeah, I mean, his name was going around. Once the story broke, I think it might have been The Sun, first of all, The Guardian, um, had it, uh, that a Westminster MP, or a Conservative MP, rather, had been arrested. Um, very quickly, the rumour mill kicked into action and his name was floating around. And then, yeah, he decided to preempt everything by... Yeah. Putting out a statement, which is a very modern way, I guess, of, of dealing with these things now. Um, but again, it's just another major headache for Rishi Sunak. Um, I mean, Scarlett will probably know more about this than me when it comes to public yeah, opinion. Yeah. But I think it just reinforces this idea that the public have already got that it's a tired, sleaze-ridden government. Well, that is it, isn't it? To change. It's that sense that, and I can remember this with the sort of fag end of the Tory years under Major, when it was just a... Even if, the, I mean, the economy was doing quite well under Major towards the end, and Blair inherited a you know, fairly good set of books, but it wasn't that, really. It was a sense that it was tired, it was out of steam, and those that were, weren't rubbish were corrupt in some kind of way. It feeds into that narrative that this party is now rotten and sim sim certainly can't win the next election. Yeah, absolutely. So we've just passed Rishi Sunak's uh, first anniversary, his first year in office. And actually, I think the story of that year has been his inability to escape the sort of toxicity of the Tory party yeah. brand. So he has been dragged down. He's the fifth prime minister over 13 years. The last sort of two or three years in particular have been uh, particularly ridden with psychodrama and infighting. And unfortunately, I think especially since Partygate, mm -hmm. the public are, you know, inclined to conceive of the party as one that is, um, you know, fighting with itself, has not got their best interests at heart, that uh, with MPs that can't behave themselves in one way or another. Yeah. And this is the last thing he needs is yet another reminder of that. And I guess with allegations like this, Kevin, it's... it's I mean, this can rumble on forever, can't it? Yeah. I mean, these things aren't cleared up by next Wednesday. I mean, this, this exactly, story yeah. will, will just kind of stay there and at some point, it one assumes in months to come, we'll, we'll get a... A response from the police. Yeah, exactly. So you're right, it's just sort of hanging over 
um, Westminster and the Conservative Party like a bad smell, really. And yeah. um, as we say, just reinforces this this impression that people have got. And the Scarlet says that they're more concerned about um, talking to themselves, fighting with one another than actually mm -hmm. benefiting the public. And it's not even as if um, Labour are pulling up any trees themselves. You know, it's not, I don't get the sense, they're miles ahead in the polls, but, you know, there's still a lot of questions. I don't think the public are completely convinced by Keir Starmer, certainly. Um, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of questions as to what a Labour government would actually look like. But I think people have already made up their minds that they don't want the Conservatives and Labour can't be much yeah. worse. I, I mean, it, it seems, Scarlett, that the Labour Party's greatest thing at the moment is they're not the Conservative Party, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Kevin's spot on. And I mean, there is a chance this will change. I do think we've potentially seen a slightly different Keir Starmer over the last few weeks. He seems to have grown quite a lot in confidence. I do think setting out what he was going to do despite potential opposition over things like house building, um, actually has the potential to go down quite well because the main thing that voters say about him, the reason why they were suspicious about him, they're saying, well, you don't trust him because he's not saying what he's going to do. And, you know, he might be saying one thing but crossing his fingers behind his back and then waiting until something changes. So if he can get a hold on that, then there's absolutely room for, I think, the public impression of him to change. But, um, yeah, up until that point, it's the Tories that have lost it and actually the public have just stopped listening. Indeed. Uh, we'll come back to that, I'm sure, to the situation now in Israel. And Israeli defence forces have carried out a targeted raid against Hamas in Gaza as they edge ever closer to that promised ground invasion. Meanwhile, top negotiators in Qatar have said they're increasingly optimistic about a hostage breakthrough. Currently, over 200 Israelis are still being held by Hamas. Qatar's Minister for Foreign Affairs also acts as a senior negotiator, has said further hostage releases could be possible, but only if the Israeli bombardment stops. Let's get more on this now with our man on the ground live in Jerusalem, Talk TV's war correspondent, Tom Much. Uh, good to see you again, Tom. What is the latest there today? So, as you said, the hostage negotiations are one of the most critical things going on at the moment. In effect, they're a major block to a potential ground invasion. It's difficult to see how a ground invasion could go ahead without killing a large number of the hostages effectively. So that acts as a sort of political break on the government here. Now, there's been another development that I thought was quite interesting yesterday, and that was when Joe Biden came out and was talking about the issue of civilian casualties in Gaza. Now, this has been a very, very hot wire topic. The Gazan Health Ministry has said it's 7,000, yet Biden has actually said that he doesn't necessarily trust those numbers. Now, pointing out that they are coming effectively from someone that was con from an organization controlled by Hamas. That said, the United Nations have previously thought that those casualty figures in previous conflicts between Israel and Gaza have been broadly uh, borne out by later investigations. But that is definitely something to keep an eye on, whether those casualty figures, as I said, standing at about 7,000 now, are reliable or whether they're inflated. We simply can't know either way at the moment because we really don't have that great insight into what is going on in Gaza under the fog of war. And it is that question that isn't going away about this ground invasion, Tom. I mean, we keep hearing that different countries, in this instance, Qatar, stepping in uh, and, and making noises around that. How are things likely to unfold in the coming days and how pivotal are Qatar to this situation? So I thought what had happened with the limited ground incursion, a sort of a lightning raid with tanks and special forces, could actually be some sort of a model if Israel don't want to go all in and try and effectively capture the city. Perhaps uh, they could almost uh, redo the idea of a ground invasion to look something like a more limited series of raids, like the ones that we saw with tanks onto specified Hamas positions that obviate the need to really commit all your forces into an operation, which was, as we've seen in previous urban conflicts, could go seriously, seriously wrong. Now, Qatar is a very interesting player here, simply because they're in some ways sometimes seen as like a Switzerland of the Middle East, 
a semi-neutral country where deals can be done with your adversaries. We know they host top Hamas leadership. And actually, during the United States negotiations with the Taliban, they hosted the Taliban Public Relations Office, where a lot of the, the, the Doha deal that the Trump administration did was actually done. So they are effectively one of the few parties that it's to some extent trusted by both sides to work out a deal, whether that's a deal on hostages or a deal on access to aid or even a potential deal about winding down the bombardment and the casualties that's causing in Gaza right now. Interesting few days ahead, I'm sure. Tom, thank you as ever, Tom much, our man over there in Israel. Back on the domestic front and the situation in Israel and Gaza continues to test Keir Starmer's leadership amongst the Labour Party as the party leader refuses to call for a ceasefire in Gaza. Four shadow ministers are on resignation watch. Oxford City Council's lost its Labour majority and over 250 Muslim Labour councillors have signed a letter expressing their disapproval. It seems Starmer's talks with Labour MPs on Wednesday did not go far enough to settle the woes held within the Muslim community, with some describing the meeting as tokenistic. Joining me now is Rafiq Musa Mohammed, one of those Labour councillors who's resigned from Leicester City Council. Uh, good evening to you, Rafiq. Nice to have you with us. Um, why did you resign? Just, just a correction, I've not resigned from the Labour Party at Leicester City Council. OK, well, happy to clarify that. Are you one of those agitating against Mr Starmer's position? Yes, so uh, I am one of the councillors from Leicester City Council who has written several letters to the leader of the Labour Party, uh, making strong representations in terms of our position and the community's position. What is it you want to hear the Labour leaders say? Well, the Labour Party has always stood as a party of justice and social equality. And at this moment in time, it looks like that the Labour Party is applying double standards on this position. So for our community, and it is predominantly a, a Muslim community, uh, it seems like he's applying double standards in terms of the strong condemnation over collective punishment that is taking place in Gaza. In the sense of how damaging this is, I mean, do you... It, 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 yes, there, of course, is a contingent within his party, the Muslim community and others, it should be said, that are really not happy about his position. Some saying his position is actually more controversial in some people's eyes than that of Rishi Sunak. But nonetheless, is this a, a, a case of, what, change your position, Mr Starmer, or we'll all go? What are you threatening here? I think at the moment within the Labour Party, we're reflecting what a lot of our voters are telling us. And a lot of our voters, especially from the community, because we do reflect the communities that we represent, are saying that the Labour Party is no longer the party for us. It no longer represents us and we're just being taken for granted. So we've got no voice, we've been abandoned um, and the Labour leadership is not listening to our voice. OK, Neil, happy to have clarified that you haven't resigned, but three out of seven of your Labour councillors have. Can we expect more of that? No, sorry, none of, the, none of three out of our seven Labour councillors that signed the initial letter have resigned. What has happened is the entire Labour group from Leicester City Council that controls the council, and we are a unitary authority, has made our position clear to the leadership of the to, of the leadership of the Labour Party to say that we feel that they are in a different place to where our grassroots members and our grassroots voters are. So we've made that position okay. clear. We've so if, if Mr Starmer doesn't change his position, what does it mean then for you guys? We we have made it clear to him that we feel we're hemorrhaging voters, and those voters that have remained very loyal to us will disappear overnight. Uh, at the next general election. One would assume Mr Starmer has done the maths here um, and he's, he's obviously taking a certain position. There's historic reasons, of course, as you will be well aware, within the Labour Party as to why he needs to make sure that he's not giving an inch to anybody that might, for one second, think he's gone a bit Corbyn on his members. Uh, but, so the, the likelihood of him changing that position is pretty slim right now, right? Well, if he's done his maths, then uh, the community is right to take that position, that he is taking their vote for granted. What you've got to remember is there's over 2 million Muslim voters in this country, 70% of them who vote, vote Labour, and we've got some very big 
parliamentary constituencies with uh, big Muslim populations. I mean, shadow cabinet minister West Streeting, he lives in a constituency with over 20,000 Muslims. His majority is 5,000. In the constituency that's how I sit in Leicester South, we've got 24% of the voting community in Leicester South is Muslim. All of these shadow ministers are looking over their shoulders to see what they do. Do you think Julia it's that serious? That, sorry to interject. It, 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 it's that pivotal that people would yeah. not vote Labour if Mr Starmer didn't change his position? That is what we're hearing, and we've done a lot of work on the ground recently. I was here when the Iraq war took place and I was out campaigning, so I'm old enough to remember that. And I would say this is 10 times worse than that. I, I would struggle to find a handful of people out of 100 who traditionally vote Labour that would vote Labour at this moment in time. OK, Rafiq, thank you for your time. Appreciate you being with us. That's Labour councillor Rafiq Musa Mohammed with us on Talk TV. Let's get back to Kevin and Scarlett to discuss this. I'm not... We, we've talked about this over a couple of days, Kevin. I'm not sure that this is... I mean, internally, it's a, a headache for Keir Starmer, and these uh, stories that we're hearing there from the councillor have to clearly be taken seriously. To the wider country, is this dangerous territory for Starmer? Well, that's the, that's the, that's the crux of the matter, isn't it? He's got two constituencies. He's got his own, the Labour base. Yep. Um, but he's obviously got an awful lot of problems there, as, as the council was showing. But he also has the wider electorate. And one of the reasons that people didn't vote, want to vote for Labour at the last election was because of Jeremy Corbyn. And we know um, all the controversy that there was over anti-Semitism in the party at that time. Now, Keir Starmer, one of the first things he said when he became leader was he was going to rip out anti-Semitism by its roots in yep. the party. And I think he's very nervous if he's, if he's seen to be in any way not standing four square behind Israel. Because he can't Israel. be seen, can he, in, in any shape? Exactly, or but the problem, there, absolutely. But the problem for him, obviously, is that then he angers a lot of Muslim voters, as the councillor was explaining there. Now, I've been speaking to a few Labour people today, getting slightly conflicting reports, but mm. it is undoubtedly a major problem for him internally. There are yeah. a lot of MPs that are getting a lot of heat from their uh, local uh, constituencies and from their voters, and they're passing that up the chain because they are, despite the fact that Labour are well ahead in the polls, they are very worried yeah. um, about what it could mean for their electoral chances next year if this row is still, is still rumbling but on. It, Scarlett, it takes quite a lot, doesn't it, to somebody to change their inherent beliefs about who they vote for. And we, we could find ourselves in a situation where people get very angry and we've seen, we saw it with Blair when he was changing union rules and goodness knows what else, and yet those people still voted Labour. Do you think that's likely to still be the case here? I'm imagining our council we spoke to there is not about to vote Tory, put it that way. Yeah, well, I mean, I think this is actually very relevant to the conversation we were just having in that um, I think at the moment they'll still be able to count on a strong enough anti-conservative vote, basically, you know, in, in an awful lot of places uh, where they'll, they're will they probably thinking at the moment they can still weather it. I mean, I think the it's more interesting, really, I think, to think about it is, you know, he's actually, Keir Starmer has previously, or at least recently, been able to use these internal party struggles to his advantage. So one thing that you hear a lot in focus groups, actually, is when he was taking taking tough lines on Jeremy Corbyn mm. over the last year and expelling him from the party, people, that's one of the few things people credit him with. And they were looking at that in contrast to Rishi Sunak, if they didn't feel took a strong enough line yeah. against Boris, for example, earlier this summer. And actually, this could be an example of where something like this comes up and it's much trickier for him to do the same. And then he might start to face some of the problems that, you know, I don't think it's anything like the scale of infighting we've had over the last years with the Conservatives yet. I don't know what it could turn out to be. But it's exactly the sort of thing that the public don't like. Uh, but, of course, he used to support Jeremy Corbyn. Well, yeah, he did. And, and campaigned for Jeremy Corbyn to be the next Prime Minister. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't the strongest support. I think he felt that he kind of needed to be in there to... Uh, certainly on Brexit as, as an issue to sort of stiffen Jeremy Corbyn's spine at times when it yeah. came to um, Labour's position on, on Brexit. But, yeah, that is something that, that, that the Tories um, wield quite regularly, that he tried to put um, Jeremy Corbyn into Downing Street. I think Scarlett's right, though. I think people... Are a bit tired of that argument. I think people, what they remember is he's kicked Jeremy mm. Corbyn out of the party. Yeah, I think yeah. that's yeah. probably more relevant. So that, that's the major headline or, uh, on that specific point. I mean, in terms of uh, the election to come, uh, you know, we hear these you know, 20 points ahead, but of course it's still a mountain to climb. It's a huge majority still yeah. to try and turn over. Um, that would be extraordinary in any other time, but we're in peculiar times right now, Scarlett, and there is a sense that Starmer could do it. But... 
it's going to take a lot for that to happen. So every vote, re I mean, they say every vote counts. I mean, it really does count, doesn't it? And the difference between holding a seat and losing a seat is absolutely crucial, like it's never been before in terms of this particular election coming up. Yeah, I mean, I think what we can say is over the last year is that the the electorate are sort of spectacularly volatile. And actually, that's what we've seen. It was the story of the last sort of, actually, I guess since Brexit, but especially over the last year, the sort mm. of four by-elections that Labour have won on those sorts of swings. Absolutely right, that's not normal. And the pace of which that was happening was even outstripping Tony yeah, yeah. Blair in the run-up to 97. But that shows you that uh, these are people that can change their mind, change their vote really relatively quickly. It might be because they've been ground down or felt like they've been ground down by circumstances, by disappointment, whatever that is but things can change very quickly and I do think the amount of uh, people that are sort of apathetic saying they don't know they don't know how they're going to vote uh, the fact that there's not a lot of enthusiasm for Labour means they'll be very worried about people changing their mind in the run-up to election day and I'll just say one more thing on that I think actually which is talking a lot about Corbyn I think it's uh, useful to remember that everything that changed in the 2017 campaign and that only happened in six weeks so you know Theresa May fell spectacularly in just six weeks mm. and that 20 point gap <clears throat> you know, all but evaporated. Yeah. So, I mean, I think they'll be very nervous. Interesting times. Um, coming up, an in-depth look at tomorrow's newspapers with Thursday night's panel. And from deep fakes to chat box, artificial intelligence is rapidly becoming part of our everyday lives. So how dangerous or useful could it be to society? You're watching First Edition. We're live on Talk TV. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who that wins? You. <laughs> do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous... What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis Sanz? No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> there's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. The one thing Labour would be terrified of if Boris Johnson zoomed back into full focus. Boris Johnson uh, isn't what he was. Most of them seem to have given up. Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. Things as fit up. as a butcher's dog. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, no, you're probably going to boot me off the show after this <laughs> dog. <laughs> Get back man. I can't say, I'm not, I'm not a Swifty. Critics, I'd say me included, <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, yeah. <laughs> Great first show, you having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man, you know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. It was a fabulous dinner until <laughs> you two uh, mooned us. <laughs> Thank God for Talk TV. It's not only the home of common sense. It's the
Welcome back. Now, a technological utopia or a computer-powered apocalypse. The potential of AI technology is becoming more significant by the day, and now the Prime Minister wants to get a preemptive grasp on what it may, may, may or might not be able to do. This is not a robot speaking. Today, Rishi Sunak gave a speech where he announced the establishment of a new artificial intelligence safety institute, the first in the world, he claimed, although one had previously been established in San Francisco a year before, so not the first in the world. Now, these reports provide a stark warning. Get this wrong, and AI could make it easier to build chemical or biological weapons. Terrorist groups could use AI to spread fear and destruction on an even greater scale. Criminals could exploit AI for cyber attacks, disinformation, fraud, or even child sexual abuse. And in the most unlikely but extreme cases, there is even the risk that humanity could lose control of AI completely through the kind of AI sometimes referred to as superintelligence. Well, next week, the UK will host a global summit in Buckinghamshire, bringing together experts, foreign governments and big business, all with AI in mind. Joining me now is the technology writer and broadcaster, Kate Bevy. And Kate, thanks for being with us tonight. So um, why is Rishi Sunak drawing the focus on AI now? What's the reasoning? Well, AI has actually been with us for quite a long time, but it's really sort of burst into public consciousness recently with the rise of what's called generative AI, things like ChatGPT, Midjourney for generating images and all the applications that can generate code and music and images and films. So suddenly it's really to the forefront. AI has been with us a long time, but this has kind of concentrated minds on the problems of it, the opportunities of it and the risks of it. He came out with some pretty stark warnings we heard there in that uh, that clip there. Should we be worried? There's always things to worry about with any new technology. And with AI, he's not wrong to flag up the issues of, you know, it, it, any technology can be misused, and that includes AI. He highlighted things like, you know, u using AI to manu help manufacture bioweapons for cybersecurity risks, that kind of thing. Those are very real risks. And actually, you know, some of them are happening now. AI is being used to craft the phishing emails that land in your inbox, for example. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, it speeds up that kind of process. I think there's much less to worry about. Out. Um, and to be fair, Rishi Sunak was, was also putting it out on the far edge as a possibility of the AI rising up and killing us all. I think that's a very low risk, but there are some very real risks. And that's the interesting thing. There was a, what, a couple of months ago, some scientists, I think Elon Musk was even there as well, saying, you know, we've got to pull the handbrake on this one just for a bit until we know a bit more. So I mean, it's clearly substantially concerning enough for some of the biggest names idea. in the world of tech to be worried. Yeah, I have some reservations about that, that sort of Musk-led initiative. There's um, a big sort of rise up of the technology industry going, oh, we must regulate this. And, you know, the concern here is what they're, they're saying is we want to be in charge of how that's regulated. They want to get out in front of regulation. And there is some concerns around this summit. That's also part of the motivation for the big tech companies taking part. You know, AI regulation has to be done in a bigger, more holistic way than just letting the, the AI companies, the tech companies, write the rules. How is it being used at the moment? Because it, it's sometimes conflated, isn't it, with just technology? You know, people yeah. see tech and they say, oh, it's artificial intelligence. No, no, it's not. It's just technology, which we've had for <laughs> ages. It's been there doing its thing. What is AI doing now in terms so of AI is powering doing the way we live? Yeah, it's doing lots of things. I mean, you know, if you look on your phone and you ask it to find a picture, I don't know, of, of your child and you've labelled it, it'll pull those up. Um, I recently looked at my phone, which I have Google Photos on, and it showed me a picture of my dad as a baby because we have all our family photos scanned in and said, is that Simon Bevan? And what it was doing was brilliant pattern matching. And it actually was a picture of my dad as a baby 80 odd years ago. So it's, it's already in use for lots of things for consumers, but also businesses are using it to generate content, um, to do code writing, code completion, to generate reports. It's it's being rolled out. There's actually quite a lot of impetus for it being rolled out already. Yeah, we know it's being used as well in the legal profession in some parts of the world to come to certain decisions and things like that. And you know, the jury, no pun, but the jury is out on whether that's you know the ethical way uh, to do legal business. And of course, in more. I suppose in more tangible terms, we're aware of things like deep fakes and that's likely to get worse. Oh, look, here's a top politician saying something outrageous, but actually it's not them. I think Starmer was uh, at the centre of one of those quite recently. We will see more of that stuff. So more 
Misinformation is perhaps one of the big question marks. Yes, very much so. I mean, I think that's one of the risks we really need to be focusing on, not the risk of you know, the robots uh, deciding to take over the world. The risk, we already have a lot of misinformation. We're seeing how it's being used to the Ukraine war and now what's going on in the Middle East. Um, and there are bad actors willing to exploit this all the time. They're already using all sorts of technology tools to create misinformation, to mislead us. Um, AI is just another tool in their toolbox. What sort of restrictions do we need? Just a final point on this. I mean, what, what, do we need a, a, a new government department almost outside um, of the we, standard sort of culture, media and tech area? We need cross-border um, agreements on this. I mean, the EU is sort of pulling legislation together. The US is pulling legislation together. So legislation needs to be harmonised across countries. Um, AI needs to be built with a responsible by design approach. That means, you know, you think about it all the way through every single step of developing it. What makes this responsible? What guardrails do we need to put in rather than retrofitting it after the, after the event? And we've got this summit taking place. Um, the invitation of China has proved fairly controversial. These are the guys that are meant to be way ahead of the game in this department. Yeah, I think it's good, actually, that China's invited. I mean, you know, I know they are advers we are adversarial with China and they are adversarial with us, but they are have done a lot of work on AI and we need them in the tent. We need them in the tent on that point. Kate, thank you very much indeed. Technology writer and broadcaster Kate Bevin with us on the programme. Let's bring back Kevin and Scarlett into this discussion. Do you lose any sleep, Scarlett, over the AI thing? I don't think about it much at all. Is that awful? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I don't yeah. think most people do, but every time I do think about it, I, there's a little bit of me that there's a bit of panic there. And I think, hang on. You know, I'm not suggesting we're going to be taken over by robots marching through sort of Cyberman style. But ultimately, we are told that is where it could, left unchecked, end up. Now you're looking scared, Maguire. <laughs> no, I was just thinking, I think I'm more interested in Cybermen than I am in AI. I just don't, <laughs> it, 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 um, it's something that I find it really difficult to pay attention to, even though, you know, I'm, I'm told we all need to get to grips with it and learn how to use it as well, you know, but um, no, I'm not quite there yet. Yeah. Kevin? I, mean, I wasn't too worried about it until I heard Ricky, uh, Rishi Sunak's speech today, and, it, and you know, he goes on about <laughs> all the dreadful things that AI could could lead to, uh, and then at the end he goes, "But you know, I don't want to be alarmist." I thought well, you're a bit late now. <laughs> You've already put the feet yes, out. he, he mentioned, but you, you can't talk about bioweapons and horrendous things happening to children, and, the, and, and then the, suddenly the world, effectively, we don't want to worry your kids. It. You know, it's you the know, prime minister speaking. He, he literally you know. says, "Don't lose any sleep over it." Well, I might be a bit late for that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't. But like Scarlett, I don't think about it a lot. But what does concern me is that a lot of the people who um, are developing AI are yep. the ones who are uh, shouting the loudest about the potential dangers of it. So you think, well, that's the bit, that's the area worried, that I scratch my head and go, hang worried, on a second. Then, These guys worried, yeah. are a bit concerned and they're involved in this stuff. Mm. They're at the cold face of this and they're saying, you know, could be a bit iffy, this. It's like, well, stop inventing it then. Yeah. Whatever you're doing over there, don't. Well, stop it and now. Then, then we get to the point where it just invents itself. It's so clever. Well, that's the thing. You it can't invents itself. unplug it. There's you another know, area... Uh, yeah, there's another area that, that is perhaps a more immediate concern, is that, and that's the amount of jobs that it could take. Mm. And I, I told this story a couple of weeks ago. There was a documentary of what Silicon Valley kind of people speaking, and they made the point... That when the internet came out back in the day, people said, it's going to take jobs. It'll take jobs and we'll be scuppered. And of course it didn't. It created jobs, millions of jobs around the world, either directly or indirectly because of the internet. Some people are saying that about AI. Oh, it's going to create loads of jobs. And these guys are going, no, it's not. <laughs> this really is not going to create lots of... There will be some jobs associated with the implementation of it. But this, almost one of the reasonings behind it is that it does stuff that humans don't have to. That's, that's, I mean, no, socioeconomic terms, yeah. that's a huge problem. It's right? scary. And, well, I mean, already, as a journalist, you, you already see people saying, well, you know, they could write stories. Mm -hmm. They could certainly write headlines. Uh, yeah. They can, you know, design, lay out, all that type of stuff. You think, well, hang on a minute. <laughs> what are we meant to do then? How are we going to get paid? Because everybody it's thinks, well, done by you know, it's not going to affect my profession, you know. And then I was looking through YouTube the other day and I saw an ad for a voiceover agency that is all AI-generated voices. Yeah. And the ad was voiced by a, a non-voice, essentially. Mm. You pick any voice you like, any accent you want, any intonation you want. You don't pay that voiceover artist what you'd normally pay. You just give them 50 quid or whatever, 
and back comes your... So there's just a very obvious way. Writing copy, your bread and butter, Kevin, forever. Yeah. I mean, that's clearly oh. something that's... Uh, <laughs> but that's the sort of area, isn't it? Absolutely. That you can imagine a machine would go, we can whip that up in 20 seconds. Probably. And we've got job. all the data, we've got all the quotes from everybody, we can cross... Fact check it, as it were, all within lightning speed. Yep. Yep. And then we move to the pollsters and take yeah. over that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it'll be us Not, three on an island somewhere. What are we yeah, but I mean, that's what led to the writer strike in Hollywood, wasn't it? it yep. was that's the, correct, yeah. That the was a kind AI of... scripts and um, the use of yeah. um, what people have done before and just re regurgitate it. Should we be worried about China, though? We mentioned there that last point uh, to our last guest, Kate, about China's invitation to this summit. I mean, these really are the powerhouse of AI at the moment. I mean, I think I agree with what Kate Bevan was saying, that it's better to have them in the tent than outside it, you know, by not inviting them, it's not as if they're just not going to get involved. They will be doing it themselves anyway, so surely it's better to have them involved in the discussions, at least. Um, I mean, I take it with a pinch of salt, Liz. Trust she's obviously got her own axe to grind as far as Rishi Sunak's concerned anyway. She's always looking for an excuse yeah, to have a go at Rishi Sunak. So, so she's criticised it. Um, but, no, I think, you know, it might be a little bit Mm. Um, controversial, and clearly there are ideological and all sorts of other differences with China. But when it comes to something which is about the good of humanity, yeah. surely it's better. But, to have and, and that's the strange that when it comes to the medical world, you know, can be changed forever. You know, those those the obvious areas in cancer work with neurosurgeons. They can't get into that part of the brain because it's impossible without essentially damaging or killing the patient. AI probably will be able to do that kind of stuff. Now, who's going to argue against that? Mm. The other side is the more sort of black mirror type implementation, you know, the social credit schemes, the facial recognition, the idea that you can't go from there to there without something bleeping you and telling you not to move. Everything is tracked, everything is monitored in ways we could not currently imagine. So come on, you've got to be scared now. So. Yeah, no, no, that, that, that I do find scary. I, mean, I guess I'm just slightly sceptical that we'll get there anytime soon, but maybe I've got my... Next Tuesday, on. apparently. Next Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, but my sources are telling me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I don't know. I, I, um, I do think with, with China, it does seem, especially on this issue, it seems much better to uh, collaborate with them, at least at this stage, if, they, if they're open yeah. to it, or at least have conversations with them. Um, but, I mean, it's not... I don't know, yeah. Not really my my area of expertise, so we will wait advise we should see on it. Um, <laughs> all right, coming up, Kevin and Scarlett are staying with us for an in-depth look at tomorrow's papers, uh, including this story in the Times. A bell to this: Rachel Thieves, as the Shadow Chancellor, was today forced to admit that her brand new book contains passages mistakenly copied and pasted from Wikipedia. We're watching the first edition. We're live on Talk TV.
Uh, welcome back. Uh, just before we get into our full paper review, let's look at some other front pages that have just arrived here. The Times is in. Uh, there it is. 200 Britons trapped in Gaza plead for help is their main headline. The Daily Mail has just arrived into the Talk TV inbox. Senior Tory MP arrested over rape and drugs, a story we were discussing earlier. And The Telegraph 2 has just arrived. Putin welcomes Hamas to Moscow is their main headline. Uh, we're back with our guest, HuffPost UK political editor Kevin Schofield is with us and the director of JL Partners, Scarlett Maguire. Uh, welcome back to both of you. Uh, quite a lot to get into, some interesting stories. We talk about Rachel Reeves. This yeah, is a belter, definitely. Scarlett. Mm. This is uh, essentially... She's the shadow chancellor, of course, for the uninitiated. Um, she's been caught up in a row over an allegation that multiple passages in her new book about women who shaped economics were plagiarised. Yeah. That's not a good look, right? No, it's not a good look. And it's a great story and it's pretty funny. But actually, I think there is a sort of serious element to it, which is this is the sort of the last thing that her brand and actually the wider Labour brand needs because it attacks her credibility. And especially, I think, when they're doing so much work to sort of say that, um, especially on the economy, that they're going to be a sort of safe and very competent pair of hands, make a big deal out of her Bank of England experience, the fact she's going to stick to very strict fiscal rules. Um, this sort of, like, quite amateur mistake is, is really, it's a really bad look. Mm -hmm. What I find strange about this is that it, it's so easy to be rumbled, right? I mean, it's, yeah. nothing, it's not that hard for somebody to go, hang on, I've read that before somewhere. Yeah, and, and there's also, there's, there's, um, there's technology, isn't there? You can run it mm. through a there's AI, program. I'm sure, if there's yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but it seems like the FT, I think the FT broke the story. They, um, they managed to do it without any need for that. It was just good old fashioned um, research. And uh, I mean, I've often wondered how front-rank politicians with seemingly busy day jobs find the time yeah. to write books, and now, now, now we know. Because <laughs> yeah. they don't actually write uh, quite a lot of chunks of them. Now, what they're saying is that um, the problem, the main problem here, apart from the blatant plagiarism, is that they didn't credit, you know, that there wasn't in the bibliography yeah, that they yeah, say, yeah. Oh, this comes from the Guardian article of such and such. Yeah. That was, they didn't put that in. And to her credit, Rachel Reese has put her hands up and said, look, this is entirely my fault. My name's on the cover. Um, so she hasn't just taken, she hasn't bought somebody else's book and just copied it. No, she's been it's a bit it, more inventive than that. a bit more that. nuanced than that. Yeah, right? there's uh, blogs. I mean, the, the Times have done a good job here showing what's in the book and where it's been taken from. And it is literally, and lots of it is word for word. I mean, it's, they've not even really rewritten it. One's from a Guardian article, one's from a blog, one's from a, a foreword to a book that Hilary Benn wrote. Um, it's really yeah. embarrassing. And as Scarlett says, for her, at a time when she's riding pretty yeah. high, actually, she had a great party conference, lots of plaudits for the speech that she gave. Um, it's not it's not great. The Tories are, as you can imagine, capitalising. They're calling her the cut and paste. Yeah, but I, it's not going to be enough to lose them the election. This no, time, it's really. not. No, I, I definitely don't think it is. But I do think that it has um, one sort of slightly uh, bigger implication, which is that actually, I think what I, you know, what you pick up in focus groups or talking to voters, and actually reflecting the data as well, is this really widespread apathy um, and distrust of politicians mm. generally. And I do think actually stuff like this is pretty damaging to that. Like, even though I mean, it is, it's a great story and it is quite funny and it's obviously, it's obviously True. not the worst thing she could have done. Um, but whenever they see politicians that are sort of doing things they're not quite meant to be doing, even if it's on the more like hearted end like this, I just think it, it, it builds up to a greater sense of these are, um, it's just like clown show, and then people start turning off. Yeah, it, it, it feeds into that. On a wider point, I always wonder, I mean, this is, Rachel Reeves is an economist herself, of course, and this is a book about women who essentially influence modern economics. Um, some silent heroes, I'd imagine that kind of theme. I, I, I think that's what she's getting at. How many people will buy that book? That's, the, that's what always fascinates me with polit political books. Mm. There's some real niche areas that, you know, either a backbencher has written a book or yeah. somebody's written something on, you know, the fiscal policies of the 1950s. Who buys that stuff? I mean, we buy it because that's what we do for a living. Yeah. Or we read it and abridge versions, etc. But... That, yeah, no, you're right. There are some. It's not going to be. It's not J.K. Rowling. No, this no, no it's, it's not going to be a bestseller. I mean, I thought, and probably just as well for Rachel Reese mm. people. She probably hopes that people now yeah, partly forget about it. Yeah. that it yeah, yeah. actually existed. I mean, there are some political books, obviously, that break through. The Rory Stewart one at the moment yeah, actually is the one that everyone seems to be yeah. reading, which is which is really good. So, uh, but yeah, this one in particular is is quite a niche. 
interest. Yeah. Um, interesting story on the Telegraph front page from Unilever. Uh, they will no longer, this is the company, uh, seek to force fit all of its brands with a social purpose, uh, said its new chief exec, following a backlash over the company's virtue signaling. Um, Heinz Schumacher, who took over the job in July, said uh, for some of its brands, giving them a social or environmental purpose simply won't be relevant. He said, I believe that a social environment purpose is not something that we should force fit on every brand. It's, it's almost gone unnoticed, this. Every now and again when we're doing phone-ins on this kind of stuff, a caller will bring it up that companies now have this sort of exit, in addition to having the HR department and, you know, what the, your values might be or our products very nicely made, this sort of almost outside of their remit, a social purpose. Um, and Unilever are obviously saying, we don't really want to do that anymore. Good for them, really, in some respects, Kevin. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think people, when they're buying Unilever products, I don't think it's uppermost on their shopping list is, well, a, I'll choose that product because of their particular social conscience as opposed to that. There's a bit of that, but, you know, to be honest with you, the Unilever's force-fitting um, brands with a social purpose have completely passed me by, mm. I've, got, I've got to say. So I wasn't even aware that, that, that they were doing it, which perhaps is part of the reason why they're deciding not to bother. Cause... Maybe it is, but I guess, you know, you think of the Farage banking thing, which kind of was in this sort of territory in a way, yeah. where companies supposedly have... Because it was always, there's that famous documentary from years ago called The Corporation, which is about seven days long, and it deals with, you know, the fact that this inanimate thing called the corporation has no soul, it has no moral compass, and that's what, you know, the whole ethos of a corporation is that. Um, and this is almost corporations going, no, actually, we have a belief system, we have different kinds of values. And, you know, that that is, you're, you're right, Kevin, I think the average person, when they're picking up their, what are they, is it, you, is it washing powder and stuff like that that you Yeah, that's make, right, yeah. That, that kind of territory. People aren't thinking about it, but we do increasingly hear big brands and name Scarlet coming out with, you know, their views on social policies. Yeah, I mean... Which we, we never got before. We do, and maybe one of the reasons that Unilever has done this is that less over here, but we've seen um, some, you know, it's spectac uh, uh, backfired quite spectacularly for some companies in the US yeah. uh, taking this sort of approach and has caused, you know, a huge amount of backlash um, from sort of actually from either side of that debate when it gets properly going. Uh, so it might be quite sensible maybe just to sort of quietly say, actually, we're not really going to bother with yeah. you anymore because it's not really what people are buying. I mean, there was one company came out... Um say, support Gaza or something, wasn't there quite recently? They put a poster up in their window. Can't think who it was now. Quite a famous high street company. They made a comment on what's happening in Israel. Um, and there's been a few others like that. I'm, I'm tempted to think a well-known soap company got embroiled in that territory as well by sort of going there into the, you know, social justice area of life. Yeah, and I mean, I, I guess going into Israel, Gaza at the moment, especially, I mean, that, that, that's incredibly raw, especially for yeah. um, particular communities in the UK. So that does seem like um, it would be very inflammatory in one way or the other, should you do it, uh, and potentially best avoided. But I mean, it's not me that's, um, yeah, thankfully making those decisions. Uh, story I just spotted as well. This is on the front of the Times and uh, inside the Sun as well. Dementia cases to double by 2040. Um, this is mostly now to poor lifestyles. And what is... I, I guess, obviously devastating to hear any stat like that because as we move forward, you kind of live in hope that cases of things that are still yet to be fully solved would progress to the point we'd have less of it, not more of it. Um, but this is telling us that the number of people with dementia is expected to almost double to 1.7 million by 2040. Um, and this is lifestyle-related, Scarlett. Disturbing. Yeah, incredibly disturbing. I mean, dementia is a horrible disease. Uh, my grandmother had it incredibly badly for actually the last sort of fifteen years of her life, and it was um, it, it was shocking, really. It completely destroyed her, and saw it um, in close quarters. Very worried that um, it runs in my family, that you know it might affect my parents and then maybe me. Um, and actually, this yeah, it, it's a shame because actually we've been hearing I think quite a lot of positive things when it comes to progress in uh, dementia and Alzheimer's drugs, but yeah. um, this this doesn't look like such good news. Yeah, and also the fact that the social care system in this country is already creaking, you know, on its knees. Really, successive well, governments have promised to come in and fix it, failed to do so, and if this is just going to put even more pressure on the system, a system that can't cope with. Uh, the situation now. So mm -hmm. if there's going to be more people requiring care 
uh, in years to yeah. come. In 2040, you know, it's not that far away. Um, it really isn't that far but away. But you don't even hear, it's not even been discussed because it's in this sort of too difficult box politically. Um, and the politicians just don't seem to have the, the desire to, to grip it. Just I mean, the social it care thing, remember yeah, Boris so. on the steps of number 10, that was right in there, wasn't it, on that oh, opening yeah. speech? But I he was just finally make, solved social care. He was just making that up. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I never, never actually didn't have a plan. I do think it's really interesting. You're right that both political parties now going to the next election are trying to be completely silent on it, actually, because I think, you know, the, there's a sort of acknowledgement, uh, potentially a tacit one, that it will involve spending an awful lot of money, and that's something that neither of them wants to talk about, quite oh. aside from anything else. Yeah, oh. I mean, you, you speak to some people and they, they give you kind of figures on it which are eye-watering what yeah. you need to yeah. really address social care, which, of course, social care isn't just elderly people, but predominantly that's what we're talking about, people yeah. who need end-of-life Yeah, end -of -life and care. it hits very close to home Things and like it can dementia. be incredibly toxic, which is, again, what we saw with Theresa May in 2017. You know, yeah. If you get these sorts of things wrong, then people can get incredibly upset about it, you know, potentially understandably, mm -hmm. um, but it's just it's a really thorny issue. But, again, it's not that... Um, well, like it's not uh, very encouraging if the answer to that is just sort of keep quiet and hope no one's yeah. thinking about it. I mean, it is. Um, uh, the more you think about it, the more you talk about it, you think, hang on, this should be on the front pages every day. This is that big, this mm. problem. Well, we've got, um, at the moment, there's another story about NHS waiting lists, which we'll come to in a second. But you consider that we've got um, an excess death issue at the moment. Excess deaths and lifestyle and cost of living are often correlated. I'm not suggesting that is the reason, but certainly it's, it's suggested that there is a problem there. This dementia story is likely to be driven by poor lifestyles. That, one would assume, has a link to uh, financial uh, status uh, of, of people and cost of living again. And then this headline, NHS waiting list will increase to 8 million by next summer. So... Even when somebody thinks they've got a problem, they can't get a treatment for the problem. So you put it all together and you think, I'm surprised Rishi Sunak wants to win the next election. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd stay away from it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And actually, I think it's quite interesting that we've not heard the government really talk about the NHS very much at all recently. And I partly wonder whether that's because, you know, they looked at, they took, for example, something like immigration over the summer and raised the salience of that issue hugely by talking about it all the time. And then, you know, voters thought they'd be even worse on it. So I actually think maybe both parties are just thinking that looks like too much of a mess, mm. not going to talk about it, it's too difficult to solve, and just hope that it doesn't come up just yet. Yeah. And well, I mean, that was obviously one of Rishi Sunak's five pledges yeah. at the start of the year was to reduce waiting lists I think you're right I think we've decided actually you know what that's not going to happen so we'll just yeah. not we'll not talk about it and hope that people don't notice but mm -hmm. um but people will notice and Labour will remind them about it coming next as well I say especially when we get to winter people are going to start you yeah. know if it's anything like previous winters wouldn't that be an obvious I mean maybe Keir Starmer will he's I'm sure they've got the chronology of how this is all going to pan out and when they announce different things but things like this you know the headline the eight million people next year social care dementia I mean he could really do with making a big statement on all of that? Because, I mean, he's likely to win anyway, but, I mean, that would be seismic if he could convince voters that he really will be the first leader to treat this seriously. Well, yeah, the, the, the one thing that Labour are really terrified, though, is that whenever they make any pledge of that nature, um, they're asked, how are you going to pay for it? Mm. And that is the question that they don't want to answer because yeah. they certainly don't want to say, we're going to put taxes up because people think taxes are high enough already. Should we do the stranded sheep story? Have you seen this? This is heartbreaking. This is incredible. A sheep has been marooned on a beach at the foot of a hill in the Scottish Highlands for two years. I feel so sorry. For two years, this little be bleating beast yeah. has been there. Uh, drones have been used to check on its welfare after kayakers stumbled across the animal during a paddling trip. Julian Turner of Brora in Sutherland uh, first spotted the animal on a shingle beach at the bottom of a rocky coastline two years ago. Uh, she was calling to us along the length of the beach, and the little sheep was calling oh, out. Oh, it's, this is the heartbreaking part. Yeah. Uh, she finally... Uh, they, they tried to follow her. Uh, she finally turned back. The kayakers were shocked to see the same animal at the beach around the corner. Um, she called out on our approach and once again <laughs> followed the group along the shore. So this sheep's desperate to be rescued, obviously. You can understand why. It's been there for two years. And it's saying as well, obviously, it's not been able to be sheared or anything like that. So it's, <laughs> it's got... It's, it's, uh, its fleece is enormous now yeah. because it's been trapped for so long. And clearly, where it is, they can't get it to rescue it. I don't know how it got there in the first place, actually. It's but, a magic sheep. Um, it's just yeah. arrived. But it's... Uh, 
Yeah, I feel really... It's the bit about it bleating, obviously saying, will you help me? Well, I don't know, they, they do bleat quite a lot, don't they? Well, this one's <laughs> the <strangest>. <laughs> Look, <laughs> I don't know much about sheep. <laughs> yeah, I don't, think they I don't do. know a lot about them, um, but I'm going to stick my neck out. I don't think they're the brightest creature on the planet. I feel sorry. So were they bleating? Were they... Come and get... <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that what the sheep yeah, yeah. was saying? I, I, I mean, I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They always just seem to be making that noise. I don't think. I need yeah. a haircut. Yeah. Oh my um, goodness. Yeah. Uh, Definitely. Feels but you know, all is good. They've established that. Um, listen, Scarlett, thank you. Good to see you, Kevin. Good to see you as well. Um, great stories and uh, more of that to come. I'm sure over a very busy weekend. That's it from first edition. Thank you for watching. We are back, of course, at the same time on Monday here on Salt TV. Good night. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous What, Spaniards. you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. The one thing Labour would be terrified of if Boris Johnson zoomed back into full focus